look good this morning. I didn't even feel good. Let me hear how you're doing over here, this section right over here. Come on, let me hear how you're doing. Come on, over here on this side. Let me, this is like youth camp right here. Come on. So, I'm sorry. I gave them second. You know, you know when you give the second chance, right? It's like, but you should have known. <laughs> That's silly. That's silly. I'm so excited to be with you today and to be sharing from God's Word and in this series. Once a year, we hit the pause button on the series that are designed to build you and lift you and lead you, and we talk about what God has called us to do collectively as a church for others in what we call our Heart for the House season. And that's the season that we're in. I love this season. It's, we put it right in the build-up to Christmas time, right after we've, we've just had this incredible At the Movie series where, and we've been saying this, we had more people show up and give their lives to Jesus than we've ever seen in the first 21 months of our church. And then we just press into this season where we just say, we didn't start the church for us. We started it so that we could make a difference together in the lives of some other people. And so this morning, you'll see this Heart for the House vision brochure, and I'll invite you to grab that for just a moment, because if you've missed the first couple of weeks, we've been talking about the four lanes of ministry that God has called us to run in as a church. And you'll see the first one listed there. By the way, that's a great photo on the front, is it not? Come on, somebody. That looks... Andrew, you, you, look at you, buddy. Just going for it. Just... Just, you better be wearing your deodorant in that photograph right there. Man, so good. And can we just, again, give it up for our worship team? Come on, they just do such a great job. They really, really do. I'm so thankful for you guys and, and, uh, and what a commitment that team has to serve you. They roll, I don't know if you know this, that worship team, uh, they're here at 6.30 every Sunday morning. Like, that's how committed they are to making this an incredible worship environment for you. So if you see them, love them. Uh, and, and thank them for what they do. Four lanes that we run as a church. To see the first one there, it's to serve our city and to serve the hurting and the homeless of our city. And I just want to take a moment right here and pause and say thank you so much for serving our city so well. These last 10 days, those of you who've been serving at the homeless shelter the last 10, 10 days, can we just give it up for everyone who's served, <laughs> given their time, made some food, just bless people. And and, and I don't see him in the room this morning, but Woody Johnston, my dad, has been there 18 straight times morning and night. And so someone came up to me this morning and they said, how are you going to do it? And I was like, what do you mean? Like, are you worried that I'm not going to be able to preach this morning? Like, what's the, what's the word? He's like, no, how are you going to live up to that legacy right there? I was like, well, I don't, I think I'll take that as a compliment for my dad. And, and, and hopefully, you know what, it honestly is very true. My dad is absolutely incredible. And I just, I, I want to take this opportunity, even though he's not in the room. This is meaningful to me. Just honor him. What a man. What a man. <laughs> Secondly, it's uh, our nation. Our nation. We impact our nation through uh, planting life-giving churches all across Canada. And it's just so cool that this week, again, we had the opportunity this past Thursday to be training up. Uh, up-and-coming church planter. They're going to be starting a new church in the new year. And again, we just had an opportunity to be training them and developing them and leading them. And thank you again for really the opportunity that I get to go and train people comes from the fact that, that God is doing something here through you. And so I want to thank you for that opportunity that you afford us as a church to, to go and impact others in our nation. And then thirdly, we get to impact beyond our nation and into our world. And really, we're engaged in this fight to see cyber sex slavery uh, eliminated in our world. And there are, this is amazing to, to consider the weight of this issue and, and to let it really sink into the level where we actually know that we're called to this fight. And, and right now, there are, there are people in cyber sex slavery and, and the fight to rescue them goes on because of your generosity. Right now, the, the fight is, is ongoing because of you. And so, and so again, I want to thank you for your giving that it's making a difference. And then finally, the most important thing, the foundational, the foundational lane of our church is, of course, to build this house, to build you up and to, 
and to build one another. And I, I'm so thankful for the vision that we have in this house. In fact, we've been sharing this, and it's written on the back, that in 16 months, we are, it's not actually even just a dream, it's a vision of what we're going to do. We are going to pack the 1,100-seat theater, the Molson Canadian Theater at the Hard Rock Casino for Easter 2020, and I'm just so excited that we can see that and believe it. And, uh, and so next week, in light of all those things that we're believing for God to do, that we're engaged in and doing, as well as Next Level Ministry in all those lanes. We're having our Heart for the House Miracle offering, and our goal is $100,000 on a single Sunday to be able to elevate ministry in all of those lanes. And, and I just love that when we dream big for God, uh, uh, that God's dream for us is always big. That it's not some sort of small dream that we just, you know, well, that would be easy. No, we dream big. We dream beyond our reach. And, and to do what God is doing, and our theme text for this whole series has been out of Ephesians chapter 2. And out of the message translation says it this way. It says, God is building a home. Like, this is why we come alongside. This is why we live to give. This is why we are going to talk this morning about influence. Why? Because God is building a home. And he's using all of us, irrespective of how we got here. Now he's using you, and he's fitting you together, brick by brick, stone upon, upon stone. And and why is it that God gets to use us? Well, of course, because he's already done some work in us through Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus that holds all things together. So we only get to have ministry and to have influence because God's already done something inside of us. Come on, somebody. Can I get an amen this morning? 930. Here's my favorite part of this, this little text right here, uh, especially this week, is that this is the fun of it. We get to see it happening day by day. We get to watch it. And I love this week, probably more than almost any week, I heard more stories of what God is doing, more miracle stories, really, than, than ever before. I mean, it was just on Wednesday hearing about some people who are having a heart for the house miracle. And then, I, and then this story, Pastor Troy phoned me up on Friday morning. His group had just served at the, at the homeless shelter. And he phoned me up. And I, I honestly, it was like, it was way too early for him to be this amped up. He was like, Pastor Shane, I got to tell you something. There's, I had talked to two guys from my group this morning. They had total miracles, financial miracles related to their heart for the house faith. I got to tell you the stories. And so he told me the stories. And one of them was so crazy that I was like, can you ask that guy if we could share that story? In fact, he went so far as to write it down. And I want to read it to you in his words what God did in their life this week. Listen to this. Uh, this. This person who had this miracle happen wrote, last Sunday, Pastor Shane spoke on what some may consider a very sensitive topic. Uh, Pastor Shane's encouragement of asking God what he would have us do resonated with me. I love that he used the word resonate. Way to go. That's good writing right there. <laughs> on Wednesday evening, as my wife and I dreamt of the future of resonate, we felt God softening our hearts. I felt, or I trust him, listen to this, I trust him with my marriage, our children, our family, our business, yet financially we haven't trusted him 100%. And he says this, as my wife and I discussed and prayed, I committed, brave move right here, to supporting whatever number she wrote down on the heart for the house card. <laughs> right, husband's like, come on somebody, like, whoa, this guy had some, faith and that was just awesome so I love this listen to this this is so fun she wrote a number I laughed <laughs> it was a challenge and a stretch we thank God the mental release was worth everything this is so cool listen to this we wrote the check the following morning not more than 10 minutes later I received an email notifying me of a savings account my previous employer had set up when I began working for them the email requested I call in to make arrangements to transfer the funds it turns out the company had been taking a small portion out of every check matching it 100% and depositing it into this account for the last couple of years and although one half was under the vesting period in other words he should have only got half now and half later well, they made a decision that they were going to release the full amount. This amount was over four times what we had written on the Heart for the House card. Oh, I'm not done. That was Thursday. Friday, I noticed another large deposit. They wrote, they wrote the card Wednesday night. They wrote the check Thursday morning. Ten minutes later, he gets this email. Friday. I noticed another large deposit had been made into our account, thinking it was a mistake. I phoned my previous employer to bring it to their attention. Man of integrity, right? The over-deposit. He phones right back up. Come on, somebody. <laughs> uh, 
I've actually heard numerous stories like that before. Like someone will come to me and they'll say, like, Pastor Shane, you never believe it. I received a miracle. My bank made a mistake. I'm like, that wasn't a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I phoned my previous employer to bring it to their attention. It wasn't a mistake. Listen to this. They felt it was appropriate to pay out my full November bonus, though the first two days of November were my last two days at the company. In total, the newfound dollars amounted to just over seven times our pledge. Come on, can we give God praise in this place? We see it taking shape day after day. And so uh, in your seat this morning is a Heart for the House card. And I would encourage you, as we did last week, to, to ask God what he would have you do in Heart for the House. And, and you can fill that card out at any time in our service. Or you can hand it to your wife to fill out at any time in the service. <laughs> And uh, you can drop it in the giving and card box as a step of faith. That God is going to enable you to give that thing that he puts on your heart to do. And that's all we would ever ask you to do is what God would speak to your heart to do. Well, this morning, I'm really excited to bring a message to you that's, that's in my heart. And I've really been praying that this message would come through uh, from my heart. I, I might start jumping up and down today because this is a message that I think is really connected to my heart for you as a church. And uh, it's on this word influence. So would you just join me in a moment of prayer? I really believe we're just going to need God's help today to, to let this uh, sink into our hearts. So Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for what you're doing already. But God, we're going we're gonna to lean in. and Come on, would you just, if you're ready to receive from God, would you just come on just in your own words in just a moment to say like, God, I'm, I'm opening my heart to hear from you today. And God, we, we do that. We open our hearts. We say we want to hear from you. We love you. We trust you. Lead us in you and in your presence, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. How many of you would say that sometimes you just sit around and you say, I'm just so influential? <laughs> like, really, we don't do this, right? We don't, we don't think this of ourselves. One of the things I love about the Bible is that there are so many of the leaders that God used to do such influential things that at a point in time in their lives, they just thought to themselves, I'm just really not that influential. Like Moses was like, God, you're not, you can't use me because no one's going to believe that you sent me. And Gideon went and hid. And David, they didn't even invite him into the room when they were going to be choosing the next king. The prophet came to take one of Jesse's sons. And then you get to Jeremiah and Jeremiah's like, I'm just too young. God, I can't do it. All these influential people. And they didn't think that they were that influential. And so I realize as I'm going to share this message with you this morning on influence, that what some of you might be thinking is that, well, this ought to be a nice half hour of daydreaming because I don't really think this is a message for me. This is a message for the better than people, for the people that have it put together, for the people that would be called to influence, the people that are on the other side of that ledger that I'm not on the other side of. There are influencers and then there are non-influencers. I fit in the non-influencer category. Can I let you know this morning that God's word has just told us that God is fitting us together and he's building this house how? Brick by brick. What does that mean? It means that you are being built upon somebody, but it means that everybody gets built on. You are called to influence. When I first started in ministry, I did not think that I was an influencer. In fact, my first employer that, that invited me into pastoral ministry, Christian Life Assembly, they, my boss gave me a book. <coughs> written by John Maxwell. It's kind of like a leadership 101, the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership. Come on, somebody. Some of you have read this book. I did not like the book. I, I, uh, I took the book, and I remember Rachel was working at Peninsula Village Chiropractic. We used to call it PV. I was picking her up outside PV that day, and I had the book there, and I, and I opened up the book, and I read the first two pages, and I thought, this is garbage. All this is going to do is show me what I already don't know about leadership, and I'm never picking that book up again. You see, because I'm not on the other side of that ledger. I'm not a leader. I'm just on the other side of this thing, and so the only way I'm ever going to be able to lead is if I can actually begin to fake some people out that I'm a leader. I, I, I wish that somebody had been able to come along to me that day and share the message I'm about to share with you right now. You see, what I thought influence was and what influence really is were miles apart. I thought that influence was me being better than somebody and then them wanting to come along and follow in my life. The problem was I knew I wasn't better than anybody. 
And so the only way now I'm going to be able to lead people is if I can get a few suckers to come along and actually believe the fakeness that I'm putting out there that my life is somehow put together. I thought that influence was being better. I thought that influence was perfection. I didn't understand that influence was actually a series of things that I believe anybody can do. Three things we're going to talk about this morning that I believe God wants to use all of us in influence. Now, I want to say this, preface it with this. None of these three things are easy. However, they can all be done regardless of your talent level, regardless of how loud you talk, regardless of your charisma, regardless of what people have said about you. Every one of these things you could begin to do today. That's going to take some courage, but we can all use these things to influence and build this house for God. Here's the three things being, first of all, from God, that we would receive from him and then turn around. It's like a swivel chair. I like a, I don't even know what pastor it was at our conference that shared that. You remember who that was, swivel chair? No, but good guess. Uh, <laughs> who's, who's the guy from Champion Center? No one cares, but yeah, tell me later. So, <laughs> so he shared this idea of swivel chairs, right? Like we, Kevin Jarrell, come on somebody, give it up for Pastor Troy in the front row. That's why he influences. He's smarter than everybody. Come on, somebody. <laughs> the total contrast of the message I'm about to preach to you. So first of us, we're, we're facing God and we receive something from God and then we turn and it looks like we're in a swivel chair and then we give that away and we're back and forth between what we receive from God and what we give away. This is how we influence. Three things that God does in us that then we turn and are able to do in others. Being known, being loved, and being challenged. Knowing people, loving them, and challenging them. So let's start with number one, the knowing. The Apostle Paul, he wrote to a church that he had started in Thessalonica. And I love the way he said this. This is is the language of the New Testament. This is the language of ministry in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul says, hey, listen, church, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Why? Because you'd become so dear to us. See, what the Apostle Paul understood was that effective ministry is not simply talking to a crowd, it's doing life together. The New Testament model of ministry, of course, includes preaching to a crowd, but much greater than that, the New Testament model of ministry involves doing life with people, letting them see your life and actually know your life and seeing and knowing them. Well, the problem with this is we live in an image-driven culture. And we fall prey to the idea that if I want you to follow me or be influenced by me, then I really need you to like me. And if I'm going to have you like me, I need to hide the flawed parts of me. As a result, most of us have people in our lives who we're doing life with, but who don't really know our lives. I'll say that again. As a result, most of us have people in our lives who we are doing life with, but who don't really know us, who don't really know what's going on in our lives. You see, what we have around our hearts is this emotional armor. We, we layer up our hearts with emotional armor because we want to protect ourselves from the dislikes, but you cannot selectively armor up your heart. No, what you put on your heart to keep the dislikes out is also keeping us from real connection. Now, thankfully, Jesus breaks through this. I love this story from the New Testament where Jesus comes along, this woman. If you've been around church, you know the story, the woman at the well. Jesus comes alongside this woman, and she's got a story. She's got a past. In fact, her past is that she's had five broken marriages. And now she's even living with a guy that's not her husband. Jesus meets her at a well, and he he begins a conversation with her. And in the course of the conversation, he says to her, "Oh, oh, why don't you go get your husband? Now, of course, she does what we all do, and she tells the most limited and best version of her story that she can possibly come up with. She doesn't talk about the five busted up marriages. She doesn't talk about the fact that she's now living with a guy that's not her husband. What does she do? She says the best version she could come up with. Listen to what she says. She says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus sees right through this, right? Jesus says, you are right when you say you don't have a husband because you've actually had five busted up marriages and the guy you're with now is not your husband. And what Jesus is saying is, listen, if you can't get to the messy parts of your story, I'm not going to be able to heal you. 
Now watch this. She turns around and she runs into the town and she, she says this. It says, the woman left her water jar, went into the town and said to the people, so see this, she's been hiding out behind a, a fraud, fake story. Well, the best version she could tell. She spends some time with Jesus. What does she do? She all of a sudden turns, runs into the town, starts talking to everyone. And listen, she doesn't even try and hide the mess anymore. She says, come and see a man who told me what? All I ever did. Like, I'm not even going to try and hide it anymore. I have a past. And I think this might be God. Why does she think Jesus is God? Jesus didn't do a miracle. All they did was have a conversation. And she thinks he's God, and she's going from, gone from hideout living to I'm going to live my life in the open and actually reach out to other people. Why? She had an encounter where God saw everything. And he didn't critique everything she'd ever done. He, I can imagine his eyes. I can imagine the way he looked at her and essentially told her, I'm the answer. Why does this matter? Two reasons. Number one, maybe you're here this morning and the story you're giving God is the limited best version of your story. And you're thinking, I'm hoping this little shred of good enough is good enough for God. And today, Jesus is saying, hey, listen, if we can't get to the messy stuff, I can't heal you. And today, there's a, a call from God to be known by God, to open up the fullness of our hearts that God would see and know all of it. He already knows it. Here's the second reason this is important. If we are going to build this house, if we're going to build what God has called us to build, a home, resonate church as a family, as a home, it is going to take, as a community, risking being known. It is going to take risking taking off the emotional armor. It is going to take risking letting people see you. If, you. if all of us are going to live the influence that God has called us to live, listen, no one wants to follow a perfect leader. No one wants to follow a better than leader, but they will follow one who will risk enough to share their life with them. Come on, will we let down, will we let people know us, and in letting them know us, allow them the thing that they actually need, which is to be known. Will you go first? And I don't just mean, will you share your story and not let anybody else in? No, I'm just talking about the posture of our hearts in community. Will you receive from God that he knows you and he sees it all? And then will you turn and towards this community and towards our city and beyond. Say, we're going we're gonna to do life of knowing one another. That's the first step of influence. Are you with me this morning? I know this is risky. I know this is going to take some courage. But come on, Resonate Church. Let me know you've got some courage this morning. How many are willing to take a next step in letting people know them in their lives? Come on, just nod your head. Just do something. Pinch your, pinch your spouse's knee. Just pinch that person next to you. Come on, say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do Listen, I don't need you to put your hand up. That's embarrassing. But come on, if there's no one next to you, just slap your own knee. Come on, let's go. Let's go. That's stupid. Um... known. Here's the second thing, and this is the most important part of influence. It's always love, right? Love's always the centerpiece. Love. Listen to what Jesus says about how he loves you. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. And now, just as in the swivel chair, then turn towards the world. Listen, this is my commandment to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Notice that before Jesus gives the command to go and love somebody, he says, no, first you need to be saturated in my love. First you need to understand the way that I love you. Before you can effectively give away the love that I have for you, you actually have to abide in my love because you can't get away what you haven't received. We need to understand the depth of God's love towards us. Now, the order of this matters, to start with being known and then being loved. And here's why it matters, both in God giving you his love and also in us influencing people with love. If you don't believe that somebody knows you, you will not trust when they say they love you. Like, if I went up to you and I was like, I love you, but I don't really know you, you're going to be thinking to yourself, 
I hear what you're saying, but I don't believe it's true. Because if you really knew me, you would not love me. And you really don't know me. And so that's why the knowing comes first. Pastor Matt uh, Keller, he's a mentor of mine and uh, actually leads the coaching network that I'm a part of. And I heard him tell this story recently, and it's just so great. He's talking about a staff member in his church. And Pastor Matt really, man, it's been awesome to watch and be around him how he loves people. And he talked about the staff member. Uh, actually, the staff member was telling the story as well. And, and the staff member said, Pastor Matt came up to me one day and said, hey, I love you. And he gave him a hug. And there was something about the hug that Pastor Matt just was like, well, this, this is just not something right here. And so he, he took a step back and he said to this staff member, actually one of his key staff members, and he said, you don't believe a word I'm saying, do you? And sure enough, because of a broken family history, because of a broken relationship with his own father, he wasn't really receiving that Pastor Matt really loved him. And so here's what he did for a season. He would actually say this. When Pastor Matt would say, I love you, he would actually say this. He'd say, I receive it, and I let it get to, I let it get to my heart. And some of us, that's what we need to be saying to God today. Because for some of us, we actually hear a faint voice of God saying, I love you. But you're thinking to yourself, but I know all that's going on over here. And so I don't really believe. See, no, I, I had a broken relationship with someone that said they love me. And so when I hear God say, I love you, I just can't really lean into it. And God today is saying, no, 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 come on. It's got to soak down to the level of your heart. Here is the level of love that God wants to soak down to your heart. Do you want to know how God loves you today? We just read it. As the Father has loved me, Jesus says, that's how I love you. You want to know how Jesus is looking at you today? He's, he's saying, every ounce of love that I've received from the Father is what I now turn and deliver to you. He does not dilute the love that he has for you on the basis of the things you're doing. No, he takes what he gets from the Father and he turns and he delivers all of it to you. And then he says, here's my commandment. Don't dilute the love that I give to you. This is my commandment that you love one another. How? As I've loved you. And so the love that I got from the Father and delivered to you, that's the very same love that I want you to now turn and swivel and posture towards the world and not dilute it down when you're reaching towards people, but love them with the same love that I have loved you. And if we do not allow the love of God to soak down into the deepest parts of our heart, to allow him to actually know us and see us, we cannot turn to the world and love the world in the way that God's called us to. We will not build the home God's called us to build. Come on, just another little pinch. Just get to turn, turn to that person beside you. Give me another, give me another pinch. So that was for me right there. That was for me. Again, you got no one beside you. Just, just like this on your neck. That's for you. That's for you. That's for you. I just got chills when I did that. Was, as I'm preaching, to my, I just did this, and I was like, oh, that feels good. <laughs> I think we need a date today, babe. Let's... <laughs> God's building a home. He wants us to know one another. He wants us to love one another. Come on, somebody. Will you risk it? Yeah. Well, there's one more part. It's not the one that we really like. Influence doesn't stop with being known and loved. We wish it would, right? Oh, I'll take you knowing me, God. Oh, come on, friend, pastor. I'll take you knowing me and then still loving me the way, uh, come on, all day long. Known and loved? Mm, give me some more of that. Challenge? Not so much. We don't like to receive the challenge of God, do we? So the Apostle Paul, he writes to Timothy, his protege, and he tells Timothy how he's to pastor the church that he's now pastoring in Ephesus. Listen to this, how he says, listen, challenge the people this way. As for the rich in this present age, I want you to gently suggest to them not to be haughty. Like if it's okay and if it works with their timelines and if it works out with how they're doing that day, you know, maybe just like gently suggest to them not to be haughty. Or, no! Charge them. A lot of translations say command them. Listen, Timothy, out of that place of knowing people, and make sure you're doing life with them so they know that you love them. But when those two things are in order, command them not to be haughty. 
or to set their hopes on uncertain riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to joy. Timothy, once they know that you know them and they know that you love them, I want you to turn to them and, and, and command them. Like, listen, Timothy, I want you to be borderline aggressive in this way. I want you to risk offending some people in order that they would what? That they would do good. Come on, Timothy, take a risk. Challenge them. To be rich in good works and generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves is a good foundation for the future. Why? Because you're better than them? No. Why? Well, because you want them to have life that's life. And they're not going to have life that's life if you're not willing to challenge them to elevate their thinking to the level of their dreams. If you're not willing to challenge them to elevate their thinking to the level of their hopes. Come on, somebody. It's going to take some challenge. And this is where most of us turn away from God. And say, I'll take the knowing and I'll take the loving. But I'm not really interested in the challenge. Wherever we have an issue with God's challenge, it's always because we have not first understood how much he knows and loves you. The issue is never with the command. The issue is we haven't really felt the weight of the relationship. Known, loved, challenged. Or notice how easy it is to challenge people that you don't love? Like, it's not hard to go up to someone that you don't really love that much and be like, I disagree with you. you I mean, you're already nodding your heads, but let me give you further proof. Instagram comments. Everybody chimes in there with their two cents about what they think differently about life than you do. Why? Because there's no relationship. I'm not risking anything. If you don't like me, the relationship's not broken. There was no relationship. Maturity in relationship, in knowing and loving people, will always lead us to be willing to challenge. Whoa. But it's not easy. Because we're risking the relationship. But that's the way God loves you. He loves you enough to risk it all. Why would he love you enough to risk it all? So that you can have life that's really life. So that you can have life that's beyond you. So that you can have his steps for your life. That's how much he loves you. So come on, church. How, how are we going to build this house? It's going to start with letting down some of that emotional armor saying I'm going to let people know me and I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to risk looking a little bit deeper into their eyes and asking a more meaningful question. Uh, we're going to know one another. We have to first, of course, receive it from God and then we're going to turn and we're going to be able to love people with the love that we have received from God. And in just a moment, we're going to respond back into a worship time. And of course, the focal point is going to be receiving the love of God. It's always the centerpiece. Whoa. And then... At some point in your influence journey, God's going to give you a platform in someone's life who you have shown up and known and loved. Not everybody, not someone that you haven't shown up and, and known and loved, but towards those that you have known and loved, God is going to give you a platform to at the right time and in the right season challenge them to another level. So I'm going to invite you all over the room to stand with me. Here's what I want. I want to ask you a simple question. And I actually think for all of us in the room, we need this question. What's standing in the way from you receiving the love of God? Where's the block? What's the thing that's keeping you from believing God when he says he loves you? Where's the block? We cannot turn and love one another with the love of God if we have not received his love, if it is not melted down into our hearts, if it's not sunk down to the deepest level that the same love that the Father had for Jesus is the love he's reaching towards you with today. And so, Father, we thank you for your love in this place. God, we want to elevate influence, not because we're better than, not because we're perfect. God, because we're just going to risk being known and we're going to risk loving and we're going to risk challenging so that we can build your home and the church that you've called us to build. And so, God, I pray in these next few minutes as we respond in a time of worship, let the love of Christ move down into the depths of our hearts. God,
God, I pray as we begin to worship and, and listen for your voice, Holy Spirit, let it go from our heads to our hearts today. In Jesus' name. Come on, we sing. Standing here in your presence, in a grace so relentless, I am one by perfect love, wrapped within the arms of heaven, in a peace that lasts forever, sinking
your eyes closed and your heads bowed for a moment in this atmosphere of worship, if you're in this place and today, you, you know you've never like fully received the love of God, fully let him know you and even received his challenge now that it's time to get out of the driver's seat of your own life and put God in the driver's seat. The Bible calls it salvation. It says that it's a free gift of God. It's not based on our good enough. It's based on his more than enough. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sin. Jesus Christ for our sins. So if that's you and you're in the place and you're saying, yeah, Pastor Shane, I, I need that. I need God's love. I need his salvation. Or maybe you're here and you know you've walked away from God and you need to recommit your life to Jesus in this place today. If that's you, would you just go ahead and slip your hand up? We're going to pray in just a moment. We won't send you out or embarrass you in any way. We're, we're simply all going to pray together. But if that's you and you're saying, yeah, today, that's my decision, Pastor, is to lean into God. I want to receive his mercy and forgiveness and love. Would you just shoot your hand up? Just hold it high for just a moment. It's between you and God. You're saying, I'll give you my life today. I'll give you my full surrender. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. We're going to pray, church. This, I'm going to invite everyone in the room to pray, but if you raised your hand, or maybe you didn't, but you wanted to, would you just pray this from your heart? Just say, dear Jesus, I know that you know me. I let you into every part. And I let your love into every part. I, I abide in it. Saturate me. And now challenge me to the life you want me to live. I'm yours. Jesus, I believe you died and rose again. So that this salvation could be mine. I receive. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church, can we celebrate? Like, celebrate.